Nathaniel for your introduction and also thank you Jennifer for giving me the chance to come here to to give a talk. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, simple models that I've been develop, uh, developing over the past few years to better understand the dynamics of uh, uh, fluvial deltas and barrier islands. And this is a collaborative effort with uh, several authors including uh, Von Boller, Chris Paola, Robert Twille, Andrew Aston, um, and Giulio Mariotti. Um, so at first it might be uh, we are to see a, a presentation with both uh, barriers and deltas in the same talk is um, but uh, I guess that the point is that um, some of the uh, there is actually a, some overlap in the modeling approach for these two systems that hopefully will actually help me to convey the, the message better how these simple models can be applied to these two different um, coastal environments. So let me um, uh, start briefly by um, giving um, some motivation. Why do we care about deltas? And um, I guess that the first answer is that uh, almost half a billion people live on deltas. Um, the second reason is that um, deltas are among the most vulnerable um, coastal systems uh, that we um, have on Earth. And one of key, key examples is actually on our backyard, the uh, Mississippi River Delta which has been losing land at an alarming rate, um, uh, almost 2,000 square kilometers in the since the 30s, uh, which is pretty much half of the state of Rhode Island. And what does this mean um, in terms of, um, um, of this area? Um, well, so if we are losing land, we are going to lose buffer against uh, stones. Populated um, centers such as New Orleans are going to be very much affected by this. Also. Um, ecosystems, uh, marshes are being lost and, and they uh, produce a very high percentage of the uh, seafood that is consumed in the United States. So there is an economic impact, uh, an eco ecological impact. Um, so why, why are these, um, why is land being lost um, at this rate? Um, and I, <coughs> I have here a sketch um, where I have some of the competing processes um, in a one segment column. Here we have, on one hand, we have uh, river sediment supply and plant accumulation that are trying to maintain the elevation of these deltaic plains uh, at sea level or above sea level. Um, but um, on the other hand, we have sea level rise and subsidence that are, tend to inundate these del deltaic plains. Um, and something I also want to point out is that in the case of the Mississippi River Delta, river sediment supply is uh, strongly affected by humans, human activities. Um, first, we have dams um, in the upstream of the river, uh, river, Mississippi River that are preventing some of the sediments to uh, make it down to the coast. And um, also, um, we have these levees protecting uh, from flooding that prevent the exchange of sediments with the floodplains during, during floods. So this uh, component, um, Sorry about that, has been uh, drastically reduced by uh, anthropogenic effects. Um, <coughs> so this is a, a very complex system. We have uh, biological processes, uh, human activities, uh, physical processes going on. Uh, one way to better understand these models is um, to uh, use uh, numerical models. Um, and due to the wide range of uh, time scales involved in the evolution of, of these deltas, we also have, uh, consequently, a wide range of uh, numerical approaches that we can use. We can um, go from uh, mass balance uh, approaches um, in crossor to rule-based cellular automaton type of models up to um, models such as DEL3D, which is uh, coupling hydrodynamics and sediment transport in a uh, three-dimensional uh, framework. So or has the ability to do it in a three-dimensional framework. I think that here, uh, Doc Edmonds used uh, solid water equations. But we can go up to really um, complex uh, uh, models. But uh, which model do we use depends on the question that are, we are trying to address. If we are interested in the average response of, uh, of the shoreline to different subsidence profiles and silver rise rates, maybe uh, we can actually um, use just an average uh, cross or model like this one. Um, if we are interested on the controls of river abolitions, then we probably want to go one step far, uh, up in terms of complexity, right? So 
But today I'm going to focus <coughs> on, on this type of models. And I'm going to give two examples, as I said, one for deltas and another one for barriers. So <coughs> the f um, I guess that it was in, the, um, it was in this slide too. The key ingredients of these models is that it's uh, conserving mass and um, we are idealizing the geometry in some way. Um, and so for this first half of the talk, what I mean by idealizing the geometry uh, in the case of deltas is that we have a linear basement or linear um, uh, slope for the antecedent topography on, which, on top of which we have the deltaic wedge uh, evolving, right? And this deltaic wedge, sedimentary wedge, is going to be um, is going to be um, delimited by the uh, three geomorphic boundaries, the alluvial vector transition, the shoreline, and the delta toe. And uh, how these um, geomorphic boundaries um, move, um, their dynamics are uh, dictated by the sediment supply uh, from the river, uh, the sea level rise, and the um, subsidence profiles that we define. So this um, sketch, by the way, is distorted. Um, obviously, this, uh, in the case of the Mississippi Delta, this basement is typically in the order of uh, 10 to minus 3 uh, slope. So in order to uh, go down one meter, you have to actually go uh, seawards 1,000 uh, meters, right? So <clears throat> this sketch is distorted. This is, I'm going to have a distorted um, uh, cross or profile um, um, in all my talk, because uh, in this way we can see it better, right? Okay, so just um, a few um, points. I, I don't want to go into the details about these equations, although once you understand it, they are actually not that <coughs> complicated. But I want to make just a, a few, um, uh, three points uh, in this slide. One is that, well, the sketch that we were looking at before is basically the same here. It's just that instead of having the names of the geomorphic boundaries, now I have the variables, right? So S is going to be the shoreline, R is going to be the alluvial uh, bedrock transition, and these are the slopes for the uh, four set and the, uh, and the basement. A key ingredient for this model is the uh, sediment flux. We need to um, um, relate the sediment flux in some way to, um, to our geometry, and um, it's typically uh, described as a power law relationship of the local slope, and this basically means that if you increase the local slope, you are going to increase the sediment flux. You decrease the local slope, you decrease the sediment flux. So it's intuitive. Here, for simplicity, I'm going to just use a scenario in which this relationship between the sediment flux and the local slope is actually linear. So theta is, is equal to zero. Okay? So if you combine that with a mass balance or external equation, you obtain the so-called linear diffusion uh, equation. And <clears throat> so this is the second point I wanted to make. Um, it's actually, you uh, can use this equation for so many different things, right? Um, and it's a second order partial differential equation, which means that typically you need two boundary conditions to solve it. But um, remember that both the alluvial bedrock transition and the shoreline are actually moving over time. So the boundaries of our domain are changing, and therefore we are going to need um, two additional boundary conditions, a total of four boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions are um, basically going to be a function of the, uh, of the geometry and, and the sea level rise rate, the sediment supply, et cetera. OK, so what can we uh, do with this model? We are going to look at four different scenarios. We uh, are going to look at the constant sea level, <coughs> constant sea level fall, constant sea level rise, and and just one sea level cycle, and see what the dynamics of the alluvial basement transition and the, and the shoreline are uh, under these uh, scenarios. OK, so if we are under a constant sea level, and we have a constant sediment supply from the upstream end, uh, that means that the area of the sedimentary wedge is uh, increasing linearly with time. And this, in consequence, means that the shoreline and the alluvial basement transition migrate in opposite directions and following a square root of time, uh, like I have here, um, times a parameter, right? And this is also what I'm uh, plotting here, right? So I, I have here the initial location. We start with no delta. We start having a same input that starts to create the same entire wedge moving the shoreline 
towards the um, seawards and the alluvial basement uh, transition towards the land. Um, now, this is a very simple and straightforward uh, solution, uh, and it's actually easy to test. So, we can use flume experiments to test whether the simple model can capture the dynamics of, um, of the alluvial basement transition. And these flume experiments, by the way, were um, carried out by Wonsa Kim and Tetsuji Muto at Nag Nagasaki University. And we can see again uh, the same plot than before. <coughs> we have the initial condition and the shoreline. Um, the result of the model is the solid line. Also here, this is the 95% conf confidence interval. Um, and the um, dots are, or the circles, are the uh, results from the uh, flume experiments. The, the the flu experiment. So you can see that this model is actually <coughs> able to capture very well what is going on. Um, what happens under constant sea level rise? Under constant sea level rise, um, initially the shoreline, as you can see, can, uh, despite the sea level rise, uh, um, the shoreline can still progress seawards because it has enough sediment supply. But at some point, the delta uh, length is too large in order to maintain the geometry, and there is um, uh, fast uh, landward migration rate of the shoreline uh, from that point on. This is uh, was called auto break by the Tsujimoto and Ron Steele, and they've been working on this uh, since then, um, both in the field and uh, with flume experiments. Here is just one of the examples um, um, that they produced in a flume experiment. You see here that this is this arrow represents the auto break during this uh, constant sea level rise scenario. Then they build um, more um, sediments uh, under a constant sea level on top. But <coughs> interesting, this break in geometry um, that um, I don't know if uh, some of the, you here in the audience are familiar with uh, the concepts from sequence and, sequence and strat stratigraphy, but that's something that um, is um, against the, some of the concepts that, that uh, are assumed by, by sequence and stratigraphy. And this is another one, actually. Um, sequence and stratigraphy assumes that the alluvial basement transition is going to respond instantaneously to NSA level uh, variations. Uh, if we have sea level fall, we should see uh, river incision in the upstream end. But, I mean, this is, again, something intuitive. If we have enough sediment supply, we uh, still can have alluvial basement. Uh, uh, we have a river aggradation during sea level fall. And this, and this can happen over geological time scales if the sediment supply is large enough. And this was, uh, again, uh, also tested with numerical experiments uh, by uh, Tetsuji Muto and, and John S. Benson. Here the um, white arrow corresponds to the location of the alluvial basement transition over time. So the sea level fall still allows some landward migration of the alluvial basement transition, and then eventually will start having river incision. And then <coughs> um, playing with the model, um, uh, you find something that, if you think about it, um, is actually almost intuitive. The uh, time lags in the response of the alluvial basement transition can also happen uh, when you have sea level rise. Um, so if we have first initially a sea level fall and then sea level rise, we can see that we can have river incision during sea level rise, something, again, that is not um, considered by um, a, the sequence stratigraphy uh, framework. This is something that, um, and I guess that I wanted to show this result because sometimes we actually can learn uh, some uh, counterintuitive, uh, counterintuitive um, <coughs> dynamics from using these simple models that, um, that then we can go and test. And I guess that is something that I still have pending, go and, and, and run some flume experiments to, to see what happens. Um, so far, all the models that I presented and, and, and um, assume, um, actually most models uh, for delta evolution assume that uh, the dynamics are a balance between <coughs> sea level rise, river sediment supply, and uh, subsidence profiles. But the truth is that if you look at, if you look at a plan view of the Mississippi River Delta, it, it, this is a map from USGS with uh, green showing the fresh marshes, red, the uh, salt marshes, pink, the brackish marshes. Uh, marshes are occupying 
a very large portion of the deltaic plane. Um, <clears throat> and uh, these marshes are actually uh, among the most productive uh, ecosystems uh, in the world. They um, are at the level of rainforests for two reasons. One is that most of the productivity uh, occurs uh, below ground instead of uh, above ground. And the second reason is that <coughs> most of the sediment column is um, under anaerobic conditions, uh, which uh, slows down uh, the composition rates. allows uh, the del deltas to accumulate significant amounts of organic matter. Here there is a stratigraphic section in, in Barataria Basin, in this area, so in uh, a pit layer as with uh, significant thickness, pit is, by the way, uh, more than 75% uh, organic matter. So it's, it makes sense to start thinking about how to incorporate organic sediments into this uh, mass balance framework. So <clears throat> what we did here is just uh, start with a very simple rule. Uh, organic sedimentation, the rate of organic sedimentation at, um, in the delta and the type plane is going to be the minimum between the accommodation rate created by sea level rise or subsidence and uh, net production. Net production is the balance between productivity and, and, and the composition. So what does this mean? This means it's actually simpler than it looks <coughs> on this formula. Is if we have net productivity that is uh, uh, larger than the accommodation created, we are going to have an excess of organic matter that is exposed and rapidly reworked and oxidized. If we have a net productivity that um, is smaller than the accommodation being created by sea level rise, we are going to have a es extra space that can be filled by inorganic sediments. And if there are insufficient inorganic sediments, then maybe that potentially could lead to uh, a shoreline uh, retreat of the system. Right? Another important point to take into account is the fact that uh, net productivity can be different, very different depending on where we are in our, in, on the deltaic plane. If we are in a fresh Mars or in a salt Mars, uh, as it has been reported uh, several times in the literature, we can have different net productivities. Net productivity in the fresh Mars uh, happens to be um, significantly larger than the net productivity in salt Marses. And this can be explained primarily uh, by, is, or is explained by, is, by these authors, primarily by the differences in the decomposition rate. In salt marshes, we are going to have sulfur reduction. In fresh marshes, we are going to have methanogenesis. Methanogenesis is a less energetically favorable reaction than sulfur reduction. Um, and therefore, the composition in fresh marshes is slower, allowing the um, uh, preservation of organic matter uh, for longer so, uh, okay, <coughs> now we have a, a model that has the uh, subsidence profiles, the sea rise rate, the sediment supply from the river, and also organic sediment accumulation. Um, and uh, always when you build a model like this, what you look is for some way to test it. Before we were using flume experiments, now what I did um, uh, after my advice or recommendation is to start reading uh, a lot of papers from the coal literature. And <coughs> so I started to um, do a lot of uh, runs uh, for different ratios of the accommodation versus net production. Uh, and again, accommodation is created either, either by subsidence or by sea level rise rate. Uh, and net productivity, accounting for this uh, potential difference, is also between fresh marshes and salt marshes. And what we have is in the vertical axis is the organic sediment fraction, which is basically going to tell you when coal is going to be able to form. Um, so this model consistently, independently of the uh, external forcing used or the net productivities used, was consistently able to capture the upper limit for coal accumulation for this ratio, which is around 1.1. And this is a well-known observation from the coal literature. And also, uh, the optimal or the maximum carbon fraction for coal accumulation happens uh, when this ratio is up, uh, okay, close to one. And it's also, again, something that was captured by the model. Something that the model didn't do well, though, is the lower limit for coal accumulation. Um, uh, data tells uh, as that is significantly higher than what the model produces. So there is probably something else going on that is not incorporated by the model. But 
I think that it's encouraging to see that um, these observations are captured by such a simple model. Another <coughs> um, interesting exercise, and I think that some of the maybe potential uh, future work uh, coming out from these uh, runs is that this means that uh, the boundary between fresh and salt marshes could actually be important on the large scale response of the of the delta. It's not only about sediment supply, subsidence profiles, or sea level rise. Maybe actually this uh, boundary between fresh and salt marshes could um, also have a, an important effect on the large scale um, scale from uh, response from a mass balance perspective. So here, what we are looking at is uh, a scenario, and these are just. Uh, uh, exploratory um, runs that uh, there is still a lot of work to do, but um, if we assume that all the deltaic plane has enough fresh water inputs to have all fresh marshes, then this delta would actually prograde towards the sea faster than a delta that has insufficient fresh water supply, uh, because it would be covered by, uh, by salt marshes, right? If we um, have um, a sudden reduction in the in the uh, freshwater marshes, uh, they um, convert into uh, salt marshes at some point. This is going to result in rapid rates of uh, shoreline uh, migration rate. It's going to enhance uh, any shoreline uh, retreat rates that we see due to uh, lack of sediment supply. So this is <coughs> something that um, I think that is uh, interesting, and there is still a lot to do. It's still at the level of uh, being just an exploratory model, right? Um, so now I'm going to move to barrier islands, uh, and this is some work that um, I started doing with, uh, during my postdoc with Andrew Aston at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and, <coughs> and I continue to do in uh, New Jersey. Here is uh, some of the coast of New Jersey which is, um, I think, approximately 70% barrier island. So it's a good place to uh, work on this. Um, if you take a cross section anywhere here, uh, you typically see something like the sketch that I, hear, I have here on the top. Um, so we, have, we can separate it in three um, regions, if you want. Um, we have the uh, subaqueous region, characterized by the surface and continuously reworked by waves and tides and delimited by the shoreline and the surface tow. We have the superior portion of the barrier uh, where uh, we have the highways and hotels in New Jersey. And